Thank you very much, Dr. Flick, for inviting me to come and speak to you today to talk to you a bit about platforms, first of all, from a sort of pragmatic point of view as an entrepreneur, to tell you how we arrived at where we are now, how we are driving digital transformation within the company, and what we're trying to achieve. Also, perhaps some of the issues about what you've just talked about as well. That will perhaps give you a taste of things to come during the discussion. Now, as Klöckner, we are, of course, steel traders. And what do we do with that? Obviously, because we've had the big names of the alumni that were on the screen earlier on with their titles. Well, it was about five or six years ago that we started thinking about how we can change our business because of the new technologies, not least because of the situation that the steel industry is an extremely volatile industry where we're seeing things going up and down all the time, where there's lots of overcapacities across the board. And we wanted to free ourselves from the rigidity of these constraints. And we saw a real opportunity to use new technologies to drive a sort of platform approach. Although in the B2B area at the time, this wasn't a very familiar approach. Now, at the time, and you can see how these things begin, it doesn't have to start with a huge project. It started on a quite modest scale. It was over lunch in Berlin that Henry Kravis was sitting with me. And I have to say, when I was 25 or between 25 and 30, essentially KKA was the first that had the company that had these leverage buyouts, this private equity approach. They'd set that up. And I'd read a couple of his books. And I spoke to him then and said, you know, I've read all your books and all the rest. And he said, look, next time you're in New York, why don't you drop in, get in touch. And I happened to be in New York the Sunday afterwards and said, all right, why not write him an email? Who knows? Maybe I'll get a response in two weeks. I mean, he's 78 and he's a bit of a Wall Street icon. And what happened 20 minutes later, he asked me whether I wanted to drop in for lunch the next day and then we could chat. So, of course, I changed my whole schedule to fit him in and we had lunch the next day and first of all he told me about how he had set up KKA and then we started talking about the whole question of disruption and he said you know this is exactly the thing and we have to bear this in mind that KKA has got to be one of the biggest companies in the world with over a million employees and this is something I always tell my CEOs, you know, you're all tr you need to be more disruptive. You have to change. Digitization is going to turn everything upside down. And here in New York as well, when I'm sitting down with the big CEOs, I always say we shouldn't meet in New York. We should meet in Silicon Valley. In fact, you need to go to Silicon Valley. And then I was saying, well, I don't know that many people in Silicon Valley. And he said, well, who do you want to meet? And I said, what about Mark Andreessen? So he got his BlackBerry up out and made a few appointments for me. And then by chance, the people from Springer were there at the same time, so I rang them. And then I had an, a couple of talks, and that's when I started to understand what the whole subject of platform really means. And of course, the big question then was, how do you start? And as Klöckner, you know, we're too small to be in Silicon Valley. We started up here in Berlin. But again, very pragmatic. There's a co-working space called Beta House, which I had a look at, and there was a free workstation. And the person who showed me around, I asked him, what does it cost, a table like that and a desk like that? And they told me a 1000 a month. And so I said, all right, I'll rent it, phoned a couple of people and said, look, you've got a new workstation on Monday, co-working space. Beta house, leave your t tie behind, and your job is as follows. You have to figure out how we can develop a platform for our own company, and you have to connect us with the community. And all of this worked really well. And now we have a hub here in Berlin with about 100 employees called Kluckner.i, in which we 
got the digital transformation of Klöckner up and running on the one hand, and I'll say more about this in a minute separately, with 50 employees so far and growing, we've got a separate platform company that we've also launched. So digital transformation, we learned a lot in the process about how you position a hub of this kind compared to your core business. You can imagine that Klöckner is a very traditional company, over 110 years old, its history with very traditional structures as well. But if you come to Klöckner now, you will probably get the impression that change has made itself felt. We have a zero hierarchy communication in the company. Every employee can go to a digital academy that we established a couple of years back. During their working time, they can take all manner of digital courses. And this means that the digital IQ of Klöckner has been significantly increased. We recently had an employee survey where some 80% of our employees have said that they understand what we're trying to do with digitization and where we're headed. So there are lots of other initiatives as well that we are constantly driving. And in Berlin, too, we've developed some platforms, first of all, proprietorial platforms and later open platforms. And the proprietorial ones are platforms that we as Klöckner sell our products on, but also sell products of third parties too, though only complementary products, of course, not competitive products. And I suppose our aim was always right from the word go to have a kind of independent industrial platform that we wanted to set up because it was our belief that this can only really succeed when it comes down to it if we think things through from the customer mindset. And that's one of the most important lessons that we learned throughout the transformation, that you always have to go back and see everything from the perspective of the customer. And if you think it through from the customer's perspective, you know, what a platform like this should be be like, then there's nothing better you can do for the customer is to have one access, one interface to access all steel products that there are and other complementary products too. So much like Amazon, if you know that website, it's not it's more convenient to buy things on Amazon because you can buy any product you like and Amazon is very customer oriented in its approach and that's how it's developed right from its inception. And so we tried to do this too and that was the step at which we said, okay, now we have to get away from the proprietorial platform and set up a separate platform. It's called Chrome in this case. And it was in fact one of the first real industry platforms in what is essentially quite a traditional industry as well. So even though we were the initiator and are still the 100% owner of Chrome, Klöckner doesn't have any particular rights on Chrome. Via Chrome, we sell our product, but the competitors have the same access to this platform and can also sell their products in competition with us on this platform. Now. You can imagine that this wasn't something that the company necessarily instantly understood when suddenly we're providing a platform for our biggest competitor and suddenly they're the customer. We're making it possible for them via our pl platform to sell their products. But if you think about it from the customer's perspective, there's no other way that you can possibly do it because having a proprietorial platform in B2B, even if there are many that have been set up there, are never going to have a really good chance. They're not going to succeed. They might work for niche products, but you're not really going to succeed because it's far too complicated for the consumer if they want to buy you know, products on 10 to 20 different platforms. That's just too much like work. So ideal for the customer is to have a single source platform. So last year, we got it going. We've got over 50 employees working on this. We've got over 20 different companies offering their products. And some of them are our competitors. And this was also an experience that we had that scaling up a B2B platform of this kind is actually far more complicated than in the area of B2C. 
because on the one hand, it's about the interfaces that you need to have in the systems of these various service providers. And on the other hand, it's also the case that most companies don't have any experience with digitization in this area. They don't know how to sell products in a digital way. They don't know how to do digital pricing or online marketing, et cetera, et cetera. And there are all manner of other things that you have to learn successively as you're doing it in order to be successful at selling your products online. And at Glockner, our digital share of turnover is now 27% or was in the last quarter. So that's an increase. And if you look at many other industries where you would expect the companies to be far more digital in terms of sales or platform based in their sales, we are above that level the average. But if you think things forward, various questions arise. How will competition look in the future under these conditions? And I thought through a couple of questions in this regard. Maybe first of all, that we have to differentiate a bit more the platform. Dr. Flick, you talked about this. Essentially, in B2B, there are four kinds of platforms. You've got your online shop, where as an entrepreneur, you sell your product. And then the next level would be, we might call it a marketplace. There's a Klockner marketplace as well, where we sell our products and complementary products too. So say we have 30 product providers, but they're selling complementary products. You know. Adding would be our latest one, the company that we work with that sell, for example, paints for metals to our clients. And we've got 30 others who sell their products that might be of use to our customers. And that's the second type. The third type of platform would then be platforms in which the competitor has access, but where you're still selling your own products. For example, that would be like Amazon where they sell their own products and they sell the competitors' products. And the fourth type of platform would be platforms that only act as providers. They don't sell their own products at all, but just sell products of third party. Alibaba would be an example of that. It's structured that way. Alibaba doesn't sell any own products, only the products of others. So, in advance of this conference, these are the issues uh, I considered um, and I thought up some questions about it because later on the panel we'll have some rather competent panelists who might be able to come up with answers uh, which I cannot, from today's angle, provide. When we're looking at uh, this issue, which is a very complicated one, oh, and before I forget, when we're talking about platforms and the four categories I mentioned, we shouldn't forget that there are both vertical and horizontal platforms. Alibaba and Amazon would be all vertical across different industries. And then there are horizontal platforms such as ours, Xorm, which um, is focusing on specific industries. And if I see it correctly, it's competition law which tends to focus on consumer protection primarily. But when we're looking at platforms such as Amazon, then customers only, at least at first glance, benefit because the customer has a huge range of products that he or she can sell via Amazon. And it's possible to compare prices. You can choose the cheapest product. And there is a similar thing if you use the App Store at Apple. Lots and lots of advantages because there are thousands of apps you can access. Facebook managed to get millions, billions of people connected. And even Google managed to put order into the World Wide Web. So at Prima Facie, there are just advantages for the client, for the consumer. Maybe it does get a little different, particularly when we're looking at platforms such as Amazon, when we're looking at it from the provider's angle. If I'm right, from the right point of view, we should actually protect the people who offer their goods. Because in the pre-platform world, there is something like an, an information asymmetry. Uh, basically, the, the lack of transparency allows the different 
um, traders to live. But the internet provides 100% transparency, and the asymmetric benefits are going to platform providers because they have all the data and access to the data. So that basically, having the data means they can build new business, and it's the traders who suffer. But the trader and the customer are both acting on a platform, and both of them are customers of the platform, even though one is a trader, one is a customer, because they are both customers of the platform provider. And now, as you've mentioned, Dr. Flake, it would be very simple to say, as you know, you do with Amazon and with Google, you can say, right, you no longer are allowed to sell your own products, only third-party products. It may not be all that brilliant for the um, user because uh, let's say you have an iPhone and you, you want to buy it uh, and it comes, as it were, naked because Apple can't sell their, their own products in the App Store anymore, only third-party products. So. For the consumer, that wouldn't be any advantage. So this means we need to look at how do things develop. And there is yet another point to be considered. Platforms and or market places online differ quite a bit from the physical market places because a physical market is, is limited in its size, but on, online there is no such thing. So the online marketplace is characterized by the fact that there is a possibility of exponential growth due to the network effect. And we know that from telecommunications. If you have um, one person with a telephone, then uh, yeah, there's very little benefit to be gained from that. If it's two people, you have a one-way connection, three people, three-way connection, four, then there are six. And from that onwards, it's an exponential increase. And once you have 100, it's thousands of connections. So that is exponential growth. And the network effect allows scalability for platform providers from a certain point onwards. And of course, the trend is then that they become monopolies. Facebook, for example. I mean, for the user, Facebook is only interesting as everybody else is on Facebook as well. If there were something like 10 different Facebooks, then the user doesn't benefit. And that's why we see a trend towards the monopoly in a platform. But that's also a question to our uh, competition law experts. What is it that would happen if these platforms then um, scale up to become monopolies? And you know, it's like an industry. There are several industries, but a very few platforms would become dominant, and they would dominate competition. So then. Would we have competition among the platforms uh, or among those who do the fulfillment for the platforms? And if we now consider the to from our mind to, to our mind high probability that there might also be a consolidation on the side of those who offer goods or services on these platforms, you end up with very few platforms and very few people offering anything there. So if we think ahead into the future, what it might look like in five, ten years' time, then I think uh, that raises a whole host of questions. And I haven't found answers yet. And maybe our antitrust bodies haven't found answers either. Because on the one hand, we'll have to uh, admit that it requires very profound expertise in all this platform subject. And interestingly enough, we are in a, on a permanent uh, um, exchange mode with the um, antitrust bodies because, you know, with our platform, so we have registered it. There are some competition data. We got various sort of regulations and, and restrictions. There has to be a sort of Chinese wall, not just a firewall. In other words, we mustn't be able to get into the competitors' uh, data. But we have very close contact with the German antitrust body because. Um, they want to learn how platforms um, actually and ultimately work. And they are interested in that because they want to avoid making the wrong type of regulation. After all, nobody would be helped if we have regulations in place which would uh, affect consumers uh, detrimentally. So there is no solution yet. And if we bear in mind how rapid the acceleration of the development is, the cartel offices, the antitrust bodies have to keep pace. And if we then move ahead and look at technologies such as 
blockchain. There isn't even a platform provider or operator anymore. So I think there's an awful lot of stuff that we could debate. And maybe today we can't really uh, cope with all of it. At least not down to all the nitty gritty, but it would still be wonderful if we could all make a step in the right direction. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Mr. Rule. Do you have any questions to him? Very briefly, are there any immediate questions? Yes, please. Please wait for the roving mic and give us your names. Sven Hansen Hörstedt, Munich. Have you had contact with this new white paper that uh, is uh, that exists in the Ministry of Economic Affairs about platforms? Uh, you know, covering all the issues you've been raising. Yes, I'm aware of that white paper. Yes. Um, by the way, we've been asked to uh, cooperate on it. I didn't at the time because I said, well, I've worked on a number of white papers in the past uh, and uh, they didn't really lead to all that much. But of course, we do have uh, discussions with the political arena. We've had discussions with the various parliamentary political parties, for example. However, the problem which seems to exist is that technological development is so fast that we simply lag behind. I'll give you one example. We talked with the ministers of justice at the time. It, it was still the current foreign minister where we talked about who has the right to need their data on Facebook, Google, or what have you. But I asked the, the, the minister of justice, what about the blockchain? Because in block, if, you, if you have blockchain technology, there's nothing you can delete, really. And that, I think, illustrates the problem. Professor Simon, Sven Simon, University of Marburg, uh, International Law, European Law. Where do you think are the main reasons for the big platforms and major companies, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, are all American companies? And one Dutch company, Booking.com, was then bought up by the Americans. Why aren't we Europeans any good at it? And what should we change? I think one is his venture capital. One recent example here from Berlin, there was a company I know very well, Get Your Guide. That's a uh, a sort of travel platform. And if you want to see Berlin, visit Berlin, you can book there. There are two absolutely fantastic guys who built up that platform. And they actually went through the first rounds of funding in Berlin. Now they've done a huge uh, financing round with SoftBank, um, generating more than 400 million. And they said, well, we didn't even look in, in Germany because um, the scale we needed couldn't, we couldn't have been provided by, by Germans. So that's one of the issues. The second is the European market is different from the American market. I mean, for example, last week we launched our platform in the United States. I mean, sure, the market is much larger and, and without any restrictions available to us, much better than, than in Europe. Uh, scaling such a platform in Europe is much more effort and, and ultimately takes a great deal longer. Christoph Paulus. Thank you. I just uh, would like to ask a supplementary question to what uh, you just said about the United States. You addressed the issue of China in your presentation. I'm currently looking into um, specific specifics of, of China. So uh, would Chinese companies be present on this platform? How would they act on this platform? And. Uh, is there a way of um, safeguarding, and I'm, I'm speaking, they were lawyer, out of a sense of total ignorance, can we safeguard ourselves that uh, the Chinese take up your idea and then um, use it in their, in their soil grow project uh, on a very large scale, and then they, you'll disappear in a barn because you're just not big enough? Yeah, it's a good um, idea to talk about the Chinese. The Chinese are much further than we are with all these platform issues. This is part of the fact that even if you take a company like Alibaba, I mean, Alibaba has, first of all, opened up a huge market for many small and medium-sized Chinese businesses. That wasn't the case for us. If you're taking our hidden champions, they were all active all over the world already. I mean, if you had a company near Hangzhou 15 years ago, they were only selling uh, in and around Hangzhou. And then suddenly Alibaba turns up and the whole of the Chinese market is open to them. But of course, it doesn't even stop there. Alibaba is marching up in Europe too. First of all, by making sure that they can offer Chinese companies products in Europe. But we do notice that there is competition with platforms such as Alibaba. Although Alibaba is a horizontal platform rather than a vertical such as we are. So we are going into sort of steel and, and related sectors. Uh, 
remolding or steel recasting and so on. Um, so we don't see the danger that you talked about yet, but we can't exclude it. It's a dynamic system. So what the situation will be like in 10 years' time, we can't say. And you mentioned how could Europe position itself, um, Dr. Flick. I mean, if we talk about this, I think, to be honest, and on the international arena, Europe isn't an issue. And when it comes to things like artificial intelligence and so on, it's a two-horse race. Who's ahead? Is it the Chinese or is it the, the U.S. Americans? Um, Kai-Fu Lee, who wrote the book Superpowers, he put it very brutally and said, uh, there's only going to be a gold and a silver medal, but no such things as a bronze. That is tough. Mr. Farholtz. Farholtz, yes. I have a brief question at the end. When we talked about Get Your Guide. Uh, you said that they collected something like 400 million, which is a, a phenomenal sum, speaking for Germany. But, of course, you also emphasized that it's like light years away from what the U.S. and other markets have available. And uh, we've been trying for 30, 40 years in Germany to develop this market. There have been many attempts, but they failed. This is simply a fact. From your angle, do you see any chance, particularly when it comes to the public sector, to create structure that will genuinely and successfully push forward our willingness to take risks? Because that's what it is. We have these long decision-making processes, and then people go for venture capital from abroad with the consequences. If it's successful, like at your guide, you've got foreign investors at the helm rather than um, allowing more possibilities of enlarging a company within Germany. Do you think there are still opportunities to do something in Germany, or is that uh, long gone? Yes, that has been around. We've thought about it. There are some concrete ideas also regarding taxation. But as in many things, politics is really almost not moving here. Uh, even Minister Altmaier, he's always um, up and about and talks about what shouldn't be. But nothing really is happening. So given all that, we shouldn't be surprised at the situation. I think there is still a chance for us because we do have some venture capital providers with a very professional setup, particularly in Berlin. But if the access to capital is made so difficult on the one hand, and if on the other hand, um, there is something which SoftBank showed as a new dimension, I mean, this is a 100 billion fund. So even if you have two, three billion, um, it's very hard to compete. That makes it rather more complex. Well, I would say theoretically, there's probably a chance, but in practical terms, no. I fear you said the, the right thing. The market has, has run away from us, and the volumes um, that are involved in, in venture capital have, have risen so astronomically that even if we were to have the proper framework in place, and honestly, I don't see a chance for that in this country because there's no willingness to do so, even if we were had it in place, I think the likelihood would be that we, we simply wouldn't be able to be competitive in the international scene. And we should also add that ultimately it means foreign um, sponsors will turn up, particularly the, the Americans. Look at center row. Um, they, they demand the center row seat and, and it basically to, to, to be at the helm. And often it means that the company is then moved. And that's the risk we have. Best example is, is the banking world, really, if you want to see it, because you're looking how solvency is changing. The banks just can't play uh, because they lack the technology something which we can see everywhere. There are many other examples, but uh, all of that constitutes a huge risk for our economy. Absolutely right. There is one more question, and then we will continue in our program. Anne von Falloam. Mr. Ruhl, with setting up Klockner I, you started um, going a new in a new direction very early with, with this new startup, new ideas, new business model. To what extent have you managed to get the team spirit to really infect the crew on this little um, racing boat? And does it now affect the old style container ship that used to be? Well, there are many ideas. And, and even in Berlin, there are many ideas where we see that it's not something which has an effect on the company. Partly, um, you know, it's too far away or too close. In other words, we need to find the proper balance within the company. So yes, people need to be enjoying a certain level of independence, but equally, we must make sure that transformation is carried to the core of the company. We've managed to do that quite well. However, I do admit it took some time until we got the thing properly 
positioned. It, it really did take time. By now, with all the projects that we're undertaking, one of the requirements is to have people from Berlin involved. But equally, there are programs where we're saying people from within the company have to spend some time in Berlin. So there is a regular exchange between the two. But we also have to make uh, that clear. It's not something which uh, just happens. I was a CEO of that, that group, Klockner, I, I myself, and I, I, I was able to, to really make it happen. It doesn't happen on its own. OK, now we're going back to the subject. The subject is competition, concentration, because antitrust um, in legal terms means to have concentrations or you mentioned in your presentation exponential growth of platforms is a, a problem of the platforms that we already have. So one question is, where do we get innovation from? The other question is, how do we jump on the platform bandwagon? And what do we do with concentration here? And I think this is the point where we can hand over to Dr. Matthias Karl, who is an expert in competition law. Mr. Karl, and thank you, Mr. Rue.